What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of CMA Podcast. How is everybody doing? Today, I am joined, a very, I guess we call it a very special guest. I'm here with my former coach, former UFC vet, and current badass of life, Jake the Hitman Hecht. How are you doing, sir? I'm awesome, man. How are you? Very good, man. Thank you very much for coming on today. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. So uh, back in 2000, I was late 2010, I believe, um, we were training in the south of Ireland in Cork and we were told we were getting a new coach. That new coach was a yank, a US badass motherfucker. So we uh, we Googled him and we checked out to see if he is in fact legit and you know the guy's got a the guy's got a couple of hands, a couple of legs, and mean intentions. And we were like, okay, we'll listen to him. What's he got to offer? And Jake came on board at the gym in uh, in Cork, and I said, you know what? I'm going to get Jake on this podcast, and we're going to talk about the old days. So Jake, how are you doing, man? It is great to see you again. It's great to hear from you. Uh, I want to relive some of the glory days. All right, man, let's do it. Let me fix my lights real quick because I forgot they were on a timer. So let me just go flip some more lights on for you. No stress. I'm going to keep this recording and I'm going to play some elevator music. Boom, doom, 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 doom. All right. If those kick off again, which they probably will, then uh, you might just see me stand up and do a little dance and uh, to kick them back on because they're off. They go off motion sensors in the room. So. Um, yeah, I'd love to uh, relive some glory days and, and talk about some, some great times in coaching um, and, and how, I, how I got to Ireland and, and all the fun times that were had when I was there. Perfect, man. I just, I, I just like, I remember uh, meeting you the first time. The first time I actually saw you was at a, a fight night. You just arrived in Ireland like that day or the day before or something. We were doing a fight night. And um, I knew you were coming. I knew that I, I wanted to have an impressive performance so that you would see some of the guys that you would be coaching. We were all kind of talking about you in the locker room. Um, I won that night, but I didn't have the best performance. I was very nervous. I was fighting a who'd, guy. Who'd you fight that night? That was Jamie Glavin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. And he was uh, he had a few pounds on you, but you had a bit of a reach on him. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I still to this day, I, I remember you said that it was a close fight, but you think he got it. Yeah. I genuinely thought at the time that he got it as well. People were explaining to me that, you know, you had cleaner boxing, but I just felt like I was defending for the majority of the fight. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't the the details of it. Uh, I remember you trying to flick your jab out there a lot and you trying to keep him at distance and him trying to, to close in on you quite a bit. Is all I remember. Really remember from uh, from that fight uh, in particular. There were a lot of fights that night, and uh, I remember you did pretty well. Like as far as your your boxing fundamentals go, um, they were pretty good. And I was really surprised to know that you had only been boxing for a very short time at at, at that time. And um, I, I remember you showing a lot, and and uh, you know us just over the next over the course of the next twelve eighteen months, however long I was there you know, kind of honing in on that and working on your jab and working on those those fundamentals that you already had and just, you know, polishing them, making them better and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I do remember that night. And I think I had only been there for like a day, maybe, whenever you guys were doing that event. So I didn't really have a chance yet to, to get my hands on anyone. Um, but, yeah, man, that was a fun time. That was a fun night. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Sweet, man. And then... You know, we took obviously you take a, a couple of days off, then you get back in the gym. And uh, I just remember you being there, being introduced to us, uh, taking the MMA classes. And we're all kind of like, you know, this guy's American. We got to start listening. He'd wrestling. We, no one ever had wrestling where, where we're from. Yeah. And, um, you know, just it didn't take long for us to trust you that you were here to help and get us to the next level. So it was a very easy transition. I think maybe you could shed some light on that if it was or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was great. So how I, how I actually got there is I fought uh, Che Mills in Cage Warriors in uh, London. And that was the roughest fight of my life. He, uh, I, was, I was set 
on taking him down to the ground and finishing the fight on the ground. And there was no changing my game plan during the fight or anything to take to, that I was taking him down and I was going to finish the fight on the ground. And I spoke to him after the fight. We, we you know, talked and were, you know, talked over Facebook and stuff since the fight. And he absolutely knew that was my game plan. I mean, there was no, there was no hiding the fact that I was a wrestler and like to take people down and ground and pound them and, and just grind out. That's be kind of my style of just grinding people out. Um, is that uh, he said that he knew that was my game plan going into it, and he just worked elbows from everywhere, elbows from defending a takedown, elbows from standing, elbows from everywhere, and man, my face really. Uh, really knew that that was the, the technique that he worked. So I, I thought I won the fight because I had taken him down two or three times and, and got into a real dominant position. I had I'd mounted him. I had an arm triangle for a while. But my face was bleeding so bad that I couldn't, I couldn't finish the grip to, to, to secure the arm triangle. My, I mean, my hands were just slipping and sliding everywhere because there was so much blood on my hands and stuff. And, uh, but it was that fight, ultimately, that got... Um, cage warriors attention and um my my coach who was in close contact with some of the organizers of cage warriors um they said they needed a coach in ireland i think they called me on a wednesday and said can you be in ireland by friday and i was like yeah and i i packed packed all my stuff and was on a plane two days later and uh you know i i was young and dumb and just ready to you know see the world and stuff and uh I, it was great. Like I look back on on my time in Ireland, um, and every day was just awesome. Like it, it was just such a such a great gig, and and such a good group of guys. And um, you know, I don't have the exact numbers, but I want to say that of all the fights that I coached or cornered for, I think we were like thirty two and one. So I think wow. that we had won. Whenever I was coaching there, I think we had won 30 fights. We had two losses and we had one draw. And uh, I just remember having so much success. Um, just focusing on, I mean, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, I, I think you just focus on fundamentals. Like you just focus on the basics. If you do the basics well, you're going to win most fights. And, and I think the answer to a lot of things and what I looked, like, looked at going into it was people in Europe don't know how to wrestle. So that's I, I looked at it going into it of people in Europe don't know how to wrestle. That's wrong, of course, but that was the mentality of is if I go to Ireland and I teach all those guys to be you know top level wrestlers, they'll beat everyone because we can take them down and we can control the fight if it's standing, if it's not, and and just controlling different aspects of it. So me as a coach, that's what I kind of what I want to do is focus on the wrestling aspect aspect of it, and that way we can take the fight anywhere we wanted to go because ultimately, wrestling can win the fight. Because you just focus on the area that your opponent's not good at. So if they're not good on the ground, we take them to the ground. If they are good on the ground, then we keep it standing. They don't, let, and we don't let them take us down. So I, I feel like wrestling is is a big, um, you know, kind of what shifts the weight in a fight as far as where you can keep the fight. You can keep the fight standing, or you can keep the fight on the ground, and, and just kind of going back and forth between those things. So that's kind of the thing that I focused on whenever I was there. Was if we have really really good wrestling and really really you know, solid stand-up and, and solid ground game, we can determine where the fight goes, whether we keep it standing there or keep it on the ground. Yeah, I, that's that's pretty much in a nutshell. I remember my, like, not being able to take anybody down and in an, MF, in an MMA fight or an MMA training, pulling guard is kind of not really a, a good option. It's not the number yeah. one option to go to. So I stopped pulling guard when you were a, a coach and yeah. I started I'm to get my did. ears a little bit bashed up. Yeah. Yeah, that that, uh, I mean, in, in fighting, you could be, you know, a, a top-level jiu-jitsu guy, but if you're on the bottom, <clears throat> you're viewed by the judges as losing. So, yeah. you know, for you to put yourself in that position, that's obviously not the place you want to be. In a jiu-jitsu match, it's fine because you're not getting pummeled from the top. No one's punching you in the face. But, uh, you know, in an MMA fight, you're just automatically viewed as losing. It automatically puts you in a, in a disadvantaged spot whenever you pull guard and put yourself on bottom. So I'm glad you stopped doing that. Um, and I hope that you learned a double leg or single leg or something. Yeah, anything to get the cauliflower ear, which apparently chicks dig. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But w- w- walking through the first few months of you uh, coaching us and, and us 
being so confident that we have this American coach, this, this pro fighter, like that's super special from, like, I think you may have heard me say this before. I was a UFC fan. I wasn't an MMA fighter. I wasn't a badass. I wasn't, you know, I don't have a background in college. I don't have anything. I was a UFC fan. I, I trained UFC, bro, you know, <laughs> but yeah. I just like remember watching you everything jake i i remember watching you walk around the gym i remember the way you talked i just remember looking and observing and studying you because you're a pro i want to be where he is um to the point where i would be walking around my nine to five <laughs> i can't believe i'm about to say this but you used to say underhooks win fights they absolutely and, do <laughs> and i'd be walking around the office going underhooks win fights and people would be like what <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, n never mind. Don't worry about it. Um, I actually, but it's I, funny that you say that. I just taught a seminar at a uh, at a martial arts gym here in St. Louis, and um, I gave them all a uh, little single subject, hundred page blank notebooks, and on the inside cover of every notebook, I wrote in big permanent marker, "Underhooks win fights," <laughs> so they never forget it. <laughs> I'll never forget that, man. I still wake up in cold sweats at like two o'clock in the morning, dude. <laughs> um, but also, I just remember when you were geared up for sparring. This was, this I, this is an admission to you now that I, I've never told you before. But I remember you had these uh, gel gloves before you wrapped your hands. Yeah. And I was kind of like looking, going, what the fuck? What's he, what the fuck is that? Wrapping his hands, doubling up with the wraps, and then we're sparring. Like the next day I went to a sports shop and I'm walking around the sports shop and I'm like, I need, um, I need gloves. And they're like, what kind of gloves? I'm like, I don't know. I just need gloves. <laughs> uh, so he puts me in the direction of like cycling gloves. And I said that they're too rough. Like I need something to go over them. And he's like, ah, you mean like weight gloves, like gel gloves. And I'm like, yeah, show me them. Next night I put on my gel gloves. I wrap my hands and I wrapped them in front of you so that you would see me do it. And you're like, huh? doubling up huh and i said works for you <laughs> so i was, I was just, yeah. so at the time whenever i was there i was just i still am riddled with hand thumb problems i mean run your hands into things every day six hours a day for eight or nine years your hands don't really appreciate it so i mean i still have i mean i'd say that my hands are probably the the, the thing that's worst on my body as far as you know, feeling the effects of 12 years of mixed martial arts. Um, so I would always double wrap my hands or wrap them with tape or just anything I could do to kind of avoid breaking them again. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, th that's a big thing is just longevity. Like whenever I think about some of the dumb stuff I would do at some of these MMA gyms that I would go to, it's just like, like sparring every day and, and sparring hard every day. Like you just knew you were coming in to just get into just a, a ball busting fight. I mean, th there's no, you don't need to do that. Like, you, you, you know, you, you go and work on your technique and, and work on different things. And I mean, there's something to be said for, you know, going and busting your ass and, and getting hit that hard every single day. But as far as longevity goes, that's not the way to, that's not the way to go about it. Um, but yeah, you, you mentioned that, that gel wrap and, and I mean, I would, I tried everything I could try to, to try and fix my hands and it still hasn't worked, but, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just remember, uh, it, it helped me so much because I had so much more support. I was coming out with less pain, uh, from not, not even sparring like pain, but just bag, bag work, hitting the heavy yeah. bag. It just, it helped me so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then I just learning more and more from you each week I went, I like, we had the MMA fight team as opposed to like the specific classes, uh, which was great in itself. I just remember learning so much so quickly from the hard sparring that we were doing. And, and then it came to my first cage fight. Like I, you know, the MMA leagues where we do the MMA on mats, yeah, like yeah. the jiu-jitsu tournament. Yeah. Um, but then August of 2011, I had my first MMA fight and you know, the guys at the gym were kind of holding me back. I wasn't ready. I was, I was training, I was learning, I was getting better and better, but I wasn't quite uh, lights, camera, action ready, you know, but 
Um, that fight happened in August of 2011. And about three weeks before the fight, you pulled me aside. Best lesson I ever learned. You said, don't think you're ready for this fight. If I don't see an improvement in a week, we're going to pull the fight. And that's the fire that was lit under my butt, dude. That was, I'll never forget that, man. That was amazing for me. Well, going back to, I mean, I, I would consider my, my time in Ireland pretty successful because, I mean, you can measure it off of how many people won, how many people won their fights. And, um, you know, I think I'm a better coach than I am a fighter. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever lights, lights a fire internally or I, I'm not going to let my guys represent the gym or represent me and, and my coaching if they're not ready. So, um, you know, I, I think that you made a lot of improvements and, uh, you know, I, I'm glad that that fire was lit. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it, it goes back to I'm, I'm not going to let a guy go out there and fight if I don't think he's ready, if, if I don't think he's going to win. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to I don't like to put people out there like, well, you know, maybe it could go our way if we get him on the ground and this that, and the other. I want you to win in every aspect. I want you to be ready to win in every aspect. And I, I want if I haven't. If you're not ready to do that, I haven't done my job as a coach to to get you ready for that to, for the fight to go anywhere and for you to do anything. And, and that was always my philosophy of, if I don't think you're ready, you're not fighting. Um, because, I, like I said, I want you to win the fight in all aspects of the of the game. You know. Yeah, that was a Friday night. You pulled me aside. Um, I went home and I cried for about two hours. I just was like I suck at this game i'm not going to be able to fight in three weeks i'm going to have to tell all my friends who i told i'm going to be in the cage to be a badass that i'm i'm not a badass anymore um so i think i watched like i don't know some fucking tv series and woke up on saturday morning and just went running and i went back to the i don't think we training that weekend but on monday um you basically put me through uh shark tank for the week and yeah what's blockade i was thinking about blockade during the week what what is that again oh man Blockheo it's been was... it's been so long since i've even heard that word because before i came to ireland i had these two uh brazilian coaches and uh i w okay so i want to say blockade is whenever uh you're not allowed to throw punches but yes, your sparring yes. partners are. So yes. you can only wrestle them. You can only take them down. And that's how you measure your success is that you're only allowed to take them down off of their strikes. And man, that's a hard lesson because uh, when someone's allowed to hit you and you're not allowed to hit them, you can only wrestle them or only tie them up. It teaches you real fast how to use your body and, and, and use the cage and use everything to, to kind of stay safe and, and not get your head knocked off. So yeah, yeah I remember... I haven't even thought of that word or that drill since you just said that. So that's funny, man. Amazing. I remember that so much. I had block hail, which that's what that was. And shark tank with the, the fighters, like the fight guys that were, that were ready for that fight night. Um, you know, I, I just, I had to impress you was my philosophy here. I, I can't let Jake pull this fight. I need to get this going. And that week, I'll never forget that week for as long as I live. That's the, the week I grew a pair, I think we'll, <laughs> we'll say. Um, but I, I trained my ass off just to, I, I guess it should have been done for myself. I think I might have done the right thing for the wrong reasons. You got to dance. We got motion sensors, motion sensor lights. Got it. Fans are looking for a, a dance next time. Okay, I'll see what I can do. I'm I'm not going to editing that out, by the way. That's staying in. <laughs> All right. But uh, yeah, what well, uh, basically th that whole week, uh, two, three weeks before the fight, right up until the fight, I just was like, I got to impress this guy because I don't want to let this guy down. I, I think I put you in a position where you have to make a decision about me. And I think that was what pissed me off the most. Um, but hey, I got through it. I don't think I even asked you, am I okay to fight? I think I just... It was just assumed because I'd done so well that yeah, week. Yeah, and, and, and I th and I think, I mean, I've put, I've put other people in that situation, and and you can see, you, I mean, it really tests people's character on if they're gonna put in the work, put in the time, 
I mean, it's hard, man. Like that that's a hard thing to do. To to put in that many hours sparring and, and to literally get your ass kicked like that for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um a lot of people go the other way and, and they'll say, Ah, I've put in this much work and he doesn't believe that I can do it, so fuck it, I'm done and, and you know, I, I can or, or, or whatever. So a lot of people go that route and they say, you know, well it doesn't matter, you know, I can work as hard as I want and and it, it's it's not gonna I'm not gonna be able to do it and, and blah blah blah, but that's not the case. I, I was looking for exactly what you did and, and, and putting in that amount of work and putting in that amount of time. And, you know, whenever you, every time you go through a fight camp, like you learn certain techniques and you learn certain things, but more than that is that you grow mentally because you know after being through that fight camp and after doing all of those things, how much you can accomplish and how far you can push yourself. So every fight camp you go through and every time you get ready for it, your bar gets raised and your bar gets raised and your bar gets raised to where, you know, like you can measure yourself on, on different physical accomplishments and things like that and look back at all the things you've done and just say, oh, I mean, I, I can do a week's worth of Shark Tank or I can do, you know, three hours worth of Blockeo or, or whatever you're doing to, to keep building that up and, and build those layers up of, um, you know, that, that mental toughness or that mental fortitude to get through it. So, like I said, a lot of people go the other way and they say, ah, you know, I, I tried my best, but it didn't work out. And in the fight game, that doesn't work. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, if you get to the point where your coach says, ah, I don't know, I don't know if you're really ready, and you say, ah, you're probably right, I'm not ready, you're probably in the wrong game. You know what I mean? Like, like if, if someone says, ah, it's not really working out, you're not really doing that well, I don't think it's going to go. And you say, yeah, you know, you're probably right. I'm, I'm probably not ready. I don't, I don't know. And just feel sorry for yourself. Like, you're probably doing the wrong sport. You, you know, you should probably take up golf or bowling or something. So, um, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, that's just rising to the occasion and, and just, you know, showing up. And, and that, that's half the battle is just showing up. I mean, you could have easily said, ah, you know, this coach that I've, I've been trying to impress for all these weeks doesn't believe that I can do it. And just stay in bed or watch TV or go out for a beer. But instead, you came to the gym every day and you got your ass kicked every single day. And you got a fight because of it. And, and you continued to grow from there. So, you know, I, I just I commend you for, for doing it and, and, and choosing the route that you went. So, yeah, man, that was that's awesome. Amazing, man. I have you, and I have you to thank for that. So and I won that fight, by the way, just saying. <laughs> um. Yeah, of but course you yeah, did that, because you weren't one of the two. Correct. <laughs> that was awesome, man. I'll never forget that. That was that was such a growing space for me, and the fact that we got through the the whole camp. Everybody went in that fight night. Everybody won. We were five for five that night. We partied our asses off that night, um, and I just you know like for me. And again, another admission to you, you watch Scrubs? Yeah. Yeah, you're my Dr. Cox. <laughs> I'm JD. Yeah. I was just like, this guy's a pro. This guy's a fucking badass. This is what I want to do. This is where I want to be. And, you know, I didn't, I, I fought pro one time. But, you know, the fact that I didn't go any further, I'm okay with that because I did my best for the time that I was competing and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And I like I look back on those times with nothing but positive memories. I had such a great time. And I left Ireland a few months later. Uh, you got in the UFC. You're like even more of a fucking badass to us all. So that 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 first win was just like, dude, I've never shouted so loud at my laptop at four o'clock in the morning. Jesus Christ. That was uh, that was a fun time. Leading up to that to that fight, uh, my coach at the time told me to start competing at 185. I was so I was normally a 170, and he said uh, the UFC is lighter because he knew that my ultimate goal was to make it and fight in the UFC. So he said the UFC's roster is lighter at 185. That's an easier route for us to go. You cut your ass off to get to 170. Just eat more and and get bigger. To, to get to 185, I was like, all right. So almost the whole time I was, at least the first 
six, eight months that I was in Ireland, you know, I was eating as much as I could. And, uh, you know, trying to get up to, to 185 weight. So I, I, I was walking around, I think, between 205 and 209, I think, while I was there. And uh, I don't know what that is in kg. You can, you can figure it out. That's uh, 155 kg. I don't know. It's not. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, uh, I was walking around like 205, 209, somewhere in there. And uh, my coach called me. It was a few days before Halloween. And uh, he said, I got, you, I got you a fight. I got you in the UFC. I was like, oh, man, that's fucking awesome. What's the date? When are we doing what, you know, whatever. He's like, uh, it's December 10th, and it's at 170. I was like, oh, my God, man. I weigh, like, 208 pounds. Like, that's 38 pounds, man. Like, how, how, how am I going to do this? Like, I got you the fight, man. Like, you lose the weight. I was like, oh, my God. So I mean, from that day, Cheers. yeah, from that day on, I don't think I ate until the fight. Like I, I mean, I was just eating. You know, I think I'd have like a banana for breakfast. I'd have chicken breast and spinach for lunch, and chicken breast and spinach for dinner. And I mean, that was it. I mean, I was I was way under a thousand calories as far as eating per day, and I was burning. I mean, I was. It, it, that was that was the show, man. Like I was, I could not have done more work to be in shape and get ready for that fight. And uh, that that particular weight loss was uh, was challenging. And uh, but I mean, made it, did it, and uh, you know, went out there. And Rich Antonito was my first UFC fight. I had trained with him in Coconut Creek, Florida, and excuse me. I actually like hung out with him and like you know he was like a, a good guy that like I kind of leaned on at the gym like we would go back and forth and like we were in similar spots and stuff like that so to end up drawing him for my first UFC fight was was pretty funny and kind of ironic and uh you know we went out there and he was just I mean he was like wrestling a bull I mean he was just so strong and just I felt like I couldn't do anything so finally he was in on he was in on my legs and I remember Che Mills just wrecking my face with those elbows. So I was like, well, I'll just elbow the shit out of his head. And apparently that worked. <laughs> so. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, man, that was amazing. There's this picture. I think you might have had it as your profile picture before. I'll post it after we wrap on this one. But you're just like, just, I mean, I guess that was the wig cut probably. You talk about just raw emotion, man. Like, it's just like, I remember whenever he went down and Josh Rosenthal was the ref and he was notorious for not stopping fights until the person was nearly dead. And I think I hit uh, Rich with like 29 punches after he hit the ground asleep. I was like, man, you gonna stop this anytime? Like, what do you, what do you want me to do? And, uh, you know, I, I stood up and realized that, that it was, I mean, it was the culmination of eight years of just grinding just eight years of being in the gym from seven o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night doing three and four and five a day practices and sleeping at the gym and just every, i mean it was just the culmination of of your three weeks of hard work stretched out over eight years that finally just i mean that was the goal to, to fight and win in the ufc and and to have that feeling of Working so hard and, and, and doing that was just, I mean, indescribable. I, I don't think I even, I think I only had like one or two drinks that night because I didn't want to get blackout drunk because I wanted to remember every second of the night, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, it was, it was awesome, man. such a beautiful night. story, man. Yeah, it was, such it was a, a lot of fun. Story. It was awesome, man. You, um, like, looking back on it, I mean, yeah, my three weeks when you say it like that eight years that's what it takes to get to the big leagues um there none of this entitled bullshit none of this uh you know new way of thinking where we all have to be very careful with how we speak and act no you gotta work your balls off well, and so you like, gotta go through the tough times like i tell people all the time that i'm not a good athlete like I'm not just athletic or like have all these gifts that I was just born with. 
I'm not that athletic. I'm not that coordinated. But I just do something until it until I can do it in my sleep. Like that's why I put so many time, so much, so many hours in the gym, is because I just practice something until there's no chance that I'm not going to be able to do that. And, and like, you know, learning a new technique. I mean, I just do it for hours and hours and hours and hours of just grinding, doing it until I know that I'm going to be able to do it. Uh, whenever I was at Hit Squad, uh, Matt Hughes's gym in uh, in Granite City. There was a guy that came there uh, from Australia, and um, I mean, he was—he had an even worse entrance story than me. I mean, he literally got off the plane, drove to the gym, and it was Friday day combat gear of little gloves and going at it. And I remember uh, I grabbed his leg on a single leg, and he had both hands stuck on the cage, and I'm holding his leg up there. I said, "You can't do that." So he let go of the cage and I just slammed his face on the ground. And that's just, well, welcome to the gym. And, uh, but he, he, he couldn't wrestle to save his life. And I used him as like a drill partner because I wanted to work takedowns off the cage. And I mean, we would do, I would just shoot on a double leg, put him up against the cage, pick him up, slam him down for hours, for months of me just shooting on a double leg on him and him trying to defend it. And he even says to this day that his wrestling is so much better because of that, just from being a drill partner, feeling all those double legs, all those single legs in on him and getting feel for how to defend him and how to, how to move off of that. So, I mean, yeah, it's just, like I said, it's just grind and grind and grind and grind and grind and grind. And, and whenever you think that you have a technique, do it about a million more times. Yeah. I'm glad you're saying this because I got a couple of people in my class that are beginners and they're frustrated that their technique is not getting any better um, after two months, you know. Oh, and man. I keep saying you're, you're doing just fine. Keep going. Keep grinding. Keep being consistent. Keep coming to class. Keep drilling. It'll come. That's, I mean, that's one of the things that drew me to mixed martial arts and, and I guess kept me there is that I think it's the hardest sport in the world. Like it's, it's just, you have to be good at so many things and it's so hard to get good at those things. Boxing is a dumb sport. I mean, I don't mean it's a dumb sport. I mean like your body's not supposed to do those things as far as moving your left foot and your left hand and pivoting on your right foot and just twisting this way and that. And like, like just the way that you generate power off of punches, like your body, it's, it's, it's unlike a lot of other sports and your body's not meant to do that. So to get your body to do that in a split second reaction to what other people are doing, it's very hard to do. So, I mean, it takes months and months and months of just throwing a jab, throwing a jab, throwing a jab. And I mean, that, that's just what you have to do. I remember I had a guy that uh, I'm still friends with here. His jab was horrendous. I mean, it looked like a six-year-old girl kind of blowing bubbles with her left hand. I mean, it was so bad. But, I mean, that's all we did. Every day he came in, I, his entire practice sessions were just go on that bag and throw jabs. That, that's all you have to do because I want your jab to be better. So, I mean, he spent – it took him eight months to learn how to throw a jab. And now he was getting ready for a fight, and in his fight, he beat the holy fuck out of the person, and his jab was spot on smack the fuck out of the guy with that jab and 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 he'll tell you to this, to this day that's his best punch because we just worked it and 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 i mean yeah man you just gotta that that's kind of the the boring thing that a lot of people don't see you know they see these highlight reel knockouts and stuff and they don't see how many times that you threw that spinning back kick or threw that you know right elbow or or whatever does the job in the gym so yeah man it's just grinding yeah, that's literally it. You just got to keep drilling. You got to keep going. You got to go through the pain of repetition over and over and over. And that's what gets you there. Um, and again, I'll bring it back to my days with you. We would be in the gym. We would be throwing 50 kicks on the bag, takedowns. Uh, the, the, your favorite one, the, uh, my favorite one that I used to get from you was the fake overhand to the single, the single leg. leg. Yeah, yeah. 
Beautiful, beautiful move. Um, I didn't actually get it in a fight, but I just, you know, I still remember it today. I still practice it when my wife isn't looking. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, what I wanted to also talk about was one of my favorite memories of my stint at the gym with you. You had just beat this guy uh, and I think you fought in a man, Jordan. Yeah. We watched the fight from the gym and you, when you got back, you assassinated this guy in three rounds. Uh, you got back from the uh, trip and I was advised that you didn't like the pictures because you looked a little uh, heavier than what you thought you would look. And I was advised not to let you know about this. You got to do your little dance. <laughs> ah, it was awesome. You were just off camera, but I'll try and edit that in. Uh, so long story short, I was told not to pick you on it, but I decided, hey, I, 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 I got to pick this guy on it now, you know? Uh, so I think I made a gesture or maybe there was a f finger in the stomach or something. I don't know. Yeah, I, think I remember so. it very clearly. Um, and you got upset with me and uh, you, I think you, you injured your hand or there was an arm injury. Yeah, I, I broke my hand in the third round of that fight. Yeah. And you basically told me when this hand heals up, I'm in big trouble. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it took three weeks, four weeks for the hand to heal up? Well, it, it healed. So fun story about that. Uh, I, I broke the hand throwing a, a fake takedown to an overhand right and cracked him pretty good. Uh, maybe on top of his head, uh, the hardest part of his body, whatever it was, it broke my uh, the index finger bone and then the middle finger bone in my hand. And uh, I... Uh, it was in Amman, Jordan, and for some reason they had brain surgeons as the on-site doctors. I don't know why. They said they got some big pay bonus for being there. So they take me to the hospital there in Jordan, and we just walked right past this overflowing waiting room. And I swear to God, I'm not making it up, there was a goat in the waiting room. <laughs> So they take me they take me back to this uh I mean it, it looked like a cleaning closet. So it's just this cleaning closet and there's this one guy in it with this little lamp on the side of the room and they sit me down and he has me fold he has me bend my hand back like this and he has a sink in this closet and he's making plaster plaster strips in the sink. So he has me lay my hand like this and he plasters it in place bent back like this like and I remember so I shortly after that trip I went to Spain to run with the bulls and a lot of beers were involved and I was like I think my hands healed like I shouldn't I shouldn't run with this cast because what if a bull stomps on or something so let's take the cast off so I went to a t-shirt shop and got a pair of scissors from the t-shirt shop and started cutting the cast off and I looked at my hand it looked like there was still a golf ball sewn into my hand I was like Oh, no, let's put the cast back on. So I bought one of those red scarves that, like, the um, matadors wear and wrapped a red scarf around the cast super, super tight. I was like, no, we got to keep the cast back on for me to run with the bulls. So whenever I got back to Ireland, uh, the cast came off, and I couldn't, I couldn't make my wrist straight because it had been stuck like this for eight weeks. So finally, after a lot, a lot, a lot of PT... And a lot, a lot of bone scraping, for lack of a better word. I saw a physio there, and he would just scrape the holy shit out of my hand and, and work out all the kinks and stuff. And finally, one day, he just grabbed my wrist and goes, whack, and just snapped it. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's fixed. And wow. then I think I had to score to settle with you. And so I said, yeah, we're, we're going to spar. And I probably threw... How many rounds did we spar? Well, backtrack to what you tortured me with first, which was the slow hand wrap while looking right at me. <laughs> I don't remember Never that. Forget. I remember every fucking moment of this, bro. And I deserved every bit of it, too. Uh, 
Yeah, I think we did now three let's, rounds. Now let's, now let's remind everyone that I was a 170-pounder that was asked to fight at 185, and this fight was at 185, so I wasn't the, the toned person that I was at 170, and you decided that there was some talk of Pillsbury Doughboy or something in there, I think. And, I just, uh, yeah, you had to be, uh, you had to be quieted. I had to be sh- uh, shunted as an example. So yeah, you you were I was the dummy. I was like uh, in a headlock, and I got my two fingers, and I just went boop. And you were like, "The fuck are you doing?" And I just went, "Ah, oh, no, it's, I was doing that to your friend, your new friend." Yeah, yeah. And I saw your eyes, the white of your eyes, bro. They they could have filmed uh, Game of Thrones on on the white of your eyes. Uh, so your arm healed up the slow hand wrap while looking right at me and uh, three rounds later uh, I couldn't walk you blitzkrieged one specific part of my the meat in my thigh Uh, I want to say I did well in that not to cry but uh, it was it was an emotional time for me for two weeks I couldn't move I couldn't tie my shoes I couldn't wipe my butt I couldn't work without the pain of of my fucking leg, um, but I deserved every bit of that. So again, I have you to thank for that. I'm glad we worked that out, and it was just a a mutual understanding of I don't know. Um, you get what you get. Yes, Jake, you do. You get what you get, man. But as you say, we worked it out. Yep. We, uh, I, I think that there was a, a mutual understanding after that that uh, if I want to relax a little bit between fights and have a few beers in Spain, then you should probably keep your mouth shut. I should probably respect your decision. For the longevity of your left leg. Yes, that was intense. But, you know, again, these are stories we look back on with some regret, with some uh, visions of, of positivity. Uh, I look back and laugh. I, I look I, at that time. I, I cried. I cried when I went home. What are you going to do? Um, but yeah, all wonderful memories, man. All wonderful memories of a, a great time at the gym where I, I learned, as I said before, how to grow up here and, and just you know, learn how to be a man and, and, and do things the hard way and not have everything handed to me, you know? Going back to kind of the gym life and just the way things were back then, I had never realized that I'd always said, get a sip before we did some god-awful conditioning. But you guys pointed it out that when Bryce, I, I just, I, it was just an unconscious thing. I said, get a sip before we before we did something and one day you guys pointed out like oh god he said get a sip i'm like i don't know what that means but i get I, and then i realized that after that that i said it every day of get a sip before we you know took cars outside and pushed them down the parking lot or um you know had to do sprints backwards uphill or you know did shark tank for 20 rounds or whatever we did um yeah that was a it was a good time and I learned a lot as a coach while I was there, and I, I look back on all those memories. Like I said, it was awesome. But yeah, man, the uh, yeah, I remember those, and uh, like I said, I remember going to that industrial estate back there, and you guys, I was driving that big Azuzu Trooper at the time, and I made you guys push that, and you had to push that for a certain amount of time, and I can remember being out there well into the night when it was very, very dark and you guys continuing to do those sprints because no one could get the right times and and no, no everyone kept slowing down and I couldn't understand why, which I mean, it's totally understandable. But uh, yeah, I remember we were out there for hours one night well into the dark uh, running and uh, having a tough time of it. Yeah, and I, I think we we knew that we were doing, like I say we, I can't speak for anybody else, but for me, for definite, I knew that um, it, was, it was a good thing because it was building my cardio. My cardio at that time, I was at my physical peak. Um, 
maybe not muscular or fucking physical peak. You used to make fun of my, what you call it, 70 year old body. I was yeah. super skinny. Yeah. Um, but I just remember being a cardio machine, being able to go many, many rounds of sparring in the gym and not feeling the tiredness as quickly as some others, you know? Yeah. And like, uh, I remember my first pro fight. So in the States, you can have, and I think in Ireland also, you can have amateur fights. So I had, uh, I had nine amateur fights. I knocked everyone out in the first round, except for my ninth amateur fight. I triangled them in the, in the second round, and I had just learned what a triangle was, I think, that week. And uh, I had a new coach. He was from Miami, and uh, he came in. He's like, you're ready for a pro fight for sure. Like, we're, we're going to get you a pro fight. And I was like, all right, man, cool. Yeah, I, I, I think I am ready. And um, I, I just kind of blew it off. Like, I, I just kind of like, I've, I've knocked everyone out. Like, th this is going to be, it's just going to go like every other fight. So, I mean, I trained for it, but it wasn't like some big epiphany of, hey, you're a pro fighter now. Like, this is the big boys. Like, you have to, you know, learn. And it was a little different in that most of the people, like in Missouri, would do like a local, regional, Missouri-type circuit. Whereas this coach had all of his contacts in Miami. So he got me my first pro fight in Miami. So the first first pro fight I had was against this jiu-jitsu world champion guy, and I barely knew what jiu-jitsu was. So I remember I, I kept hitting him with, like, standing combinations and then dropping him, and then I would just jump into his guard because I'm like, oh, he's almost done. I'm about to knock him out. So I'd jump into his guard, raining down punches, and he'd be throwing up triangles, arm bars, sweeping me. I mean, just no problem, like... And then I'd, I'd just fight for my life to get back up. I mean, he put me in a triangle, and I just the only thing I knew how to do was pick him up and slam him. And and he'd give me an arm bar, pick him up and slam him. Like, it's the only thing I knew how to do. And I ended up losing that fight on decision. But I remember in, in the last round, I was so tired. I mean, I, I could barely keep my hands up. And from that point on, I was like, I'll never get tired in a fight again. And that's where I wanted to teach or to, to get into everyone I ever coached is that You've never had a fight whenever you're in the ring with someone and you can't lift your hands up. Like, it's just the worst feeling in the world. And that's the easiest thing to fix. Like, it, it's hard to teach people technique on, you know, how to throw a proper, you know, left hook and, and combination and, 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 you know, mix in with tie kicks and knees and everything like that. It's easy just to run someone to the ground until their cardio improves. So that's the easiest thing to fix. That's why I always focused on just your cardio was not going to be what you were going to lose because of. Yeah, back back when it was a oh geez, I don't know, just all these memories going through my head now of of, of you putting us through this horrible sweat induced training, but that you would do it with us. So it wasn't like we were just being militarized into these things. You you were training along with us. And that was the biggest motivational factor for me at that time. It was just that, you know, we had this amazing coach who would train with us, who would get you know, you get your elbows greasy with us. And yeah. again, wonderful, wonderful memories of those hard days training that, that built our character along with our technique and our cardio. But for me, yeah. I take away from all of this is my character that I built, that no quit mentality that you taught me. Like Kieran, Justin, a few of the other guys at the gym that trained with us, you got to do your dance. <laughs> I'm leaving all that in. Um, yeah, they, they taught me how to tie my shoelaces and walk, but but you taught me how to run, man. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for all those memories. Well, that's awesome, man. Like, there's no greater compliment that you could give me than than to say that, you know, I had that kind of impact or, or you know, you've gotten to where you've gotten to today because of some little snippet or some little excerpt from, from my coaching. So really, man, there's 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 no greater compliment you could give me than to say that, you know, you took something from me and, and you're trying to pass it along to someone else also. Yeah, that is exactly why I'm here. That's exactly why I wanted to reach out to you and, and get you to have a conversation with me here because I am in a unique position that I've never been in before. Uh, I get to see people when they're at their peak and they're at their best technical, uh, technically, when they're sparring, when they're, when they're winning. You're back. Yeah, it's okay. sorry. 
Uh, I get to see people when they're at their peak and I get to see people when they're technically at their best, but I also get to see people when they're at their most vulnerable and weak. Um, and that's a unique feeling for me because I've been there. I've certainly been there with you. You've seen me at my weakest. You've seen me at my most vulnerable. You've seen me being complete, completely done in the gym. And, you know, I picked myself up and I made sure that I, I, I didn't quit. And I learned all that from you. And I'm, I'm trying to pass this on to everybody else who's under my instruction now. Hey, keep going. Keep pushing. Keep drilling. Keep jabbing. Keep going, you know? You know? Yeah, and, and, and there's, so, there's so much mental aspect of the game that gets overlooked as far as um you know performance anxiety and 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 things like that uh, i can remember i had a coach here in the states um really really good muay thai coach and wanted to compete uh in i mean he'd been to thailand a bunch of times and 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 things like that but he had so much performance anxiety when it came to fights and that i so i would corner him and he would corner me and he would just, I remember him in the locker room just being a mess. I mean, this is a guy that, I mean, he is really, really, really good as far as technically sound Muay Thai. And, I mean, he'd just be a mess in the locker room. Just, oh, man, what about this? What about this? What about this? I'm like, man, just go out and just treat it like a sparring day. Like, just relax. But so many people, when you have them in the, in the, in the, in the locker room before you're about to walk out there, it's a big emotional adrenaline rush, like crazy time. And to see how people respond to that and to see, um, you know, what they do and how they perform, that's why you have to train so hard in the gym. But it's also, like we said, a big mental hurdle to get over is his big thing was all these people that look up to me and that I coach and try and teach are going to see me perform and what if I don't what if I don't perform up to par or what if I don't do well or what if I lose and it's just like all you can do is just train your ass off and if you know that you put everything you could into every session you could like win or lose that's all you can do you know like we talked about earlier you grow mentally and you get past all these mental hurdles with every fight camp that you go through and really you get more confidence and you can go into a fight more relaxed knowing that you did everything you can do if 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 they if they did more than you or if they have better technique than you or just there's so many ways you can lose a fight so you know to say what if i lose like who cares if you lose man like go out there and 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 do what you know how to do and do what you've been trained to do and if it works it works if it doesn't there's another fight who cares you know, yeah. but that that's a really hard. Th it's easy for me to sit here and say that. And it's I mean, I had a, a lot of performance anxiety whenever I was, you know, going through and doing what I was doing and, and, and things like that. And, you know, saw a sports psychiatrist and, and things like that. And there's a lot of mental aspects of the game that aren't really talked about as much as just getting in the gym and grinding. But that's a big aspect of the game, because if your mind's not there to perform like your, your body's not going to respond properly. So, you know, that that's also a big aspect of the game of having that confidence through training and i think by us by by you going through all the training in ireland and, and and going through those grinding 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 times knowing that there's no way this guy trained as hard as me and there's no way that he's going to do something that i haven't seen or that, that i'm not prepared to do because that was my job as a coach was to give you every situation or every possible event that might happen and and make sure that you know what to do and you're prepared for that so I think that's one thing that, that as a coach I really liked doing was giving them that confidence of you've done everything you can possibly do. I know that going through every session with you and, and being there and being a hands-on coach, I know that you've done everything you can do. So if you go out there and you lose, you'll get them next time. Like there, there, there's nothing you can do about it because you did everything you could possibly do. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. It's if, if the goal is... Uh, to get your hand raised every single time and there's no other option and you're not going to be satisfied, then, you know, it's maybe it's, it's not the right game for you. Guaranteed victory is, is, is not a good reason to, yeah. to train and, and to get yourself on, the, on, the, on a fight card or whatever. But it's just, yeah, doing your best no matter what it is. MMA training, uh, your job, 
your relationship, whatever. Just doing your best and leaving no room for that variable to be questioned. And yeah. You could only learn that with hard work. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, just grinding away. And what, what type of training are you doing now? You don't, you're not doing much MMA. I train people every once in a like I coach like some striking I coach some jujitsu here and there. Um, I, I try and get as many like roles and, and stuff. I mean, it's been years since I've sparred or like done any like striking or anything like that. Um, I've gotten into uh, triathlons recently and uh, my wife and I were watching a documentary on uh, the Iron Cowboy. Do you know who this person is? So he did uh, 50 Ironman triathlons in 50 different states in 50 days. What? what? So, yeah. So an, so an Ironman triathlon is 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike, and then a 26.2-mile run. And he did all that, like I said, in 50 different states in 50 different days, or in 50 days. And uh, my wife and I watched that documentary, and um, she kind of jokingly jabbed at me, similar to how you did, um, of, I bet you couldn't do one Iron Man. And I was like, okay. So uh, I spent the next 10 months uh, training for it, and uh, in 2019, I did my first Iron Man. And uh, it was, it's a, it's a different type of mental toughness. To, to go that long and just keep grinding and keep going. And just, it, 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 it's almost like, you know, every training session, you're going against your training partners and your sparring partners. Whenever you're doing a triathlon, you're just competing against yourself. Like you're just, you know, it, it, a lot of mental games of, you know, you could stop now or, you know, you need to go faster in this leg or like you need to get this time and like things like that. And it, it's definitely... Uh, it's it's a different type of it's a different type of training and it's uh it's a lot of fun like it's it's I never I never you know thought I'd consider myself a distant distance athlete by any means but uh it's it's a lot of fun it's it's a it's a new kind of challenge. Amazing that that you said the fifty fifty and fifty I'm like that is insane I wouldn't be able to go on holidays for fifty days in fifty states <laughs> right. Like, I think, and I think he had, I think he has like four kids and he brought his wife and four kids to all of the events. Jesus and it was cra like, yeah, you should watch, you should watch the documentary. He, uh, I mean, it, it's a hell of an accomplishment and he got it. He, he did it. Um, I think to, uh, raise money for childhood obesity, I think. And he, he didn't make his goals and, and it was, it was kind of a sad story that he wasn't able to to accomplish the, the fiscal goal that he was after of the cause of why he was doing it, but just the accomplishment of him doing it. Um, I mean, he, I think he tore like both labrums in his shoulders, both labrums in his hips. And like, he was just having a rough time, but I mean, I'll never do that. I, I can promise you that, that I'll never do anything like that, but just, you know, get, getting into it like that and, and, and doing the Ironman stuff. And it's a lot of fun. And, uh, since then, like since I've been kind of out of the fight game, I try and set like different goals for myself throughout the year. And uh, my goal this year was to swim a kilometer in ice water. So I went to, uh, what the fuck? What the fuck? <laughs> I, I spent about six months, I'd say doing, uh, ice baths. So I'd fill up this big six foot tube that I could stand up in with, uh, 36 degree water. And I'd sit in it for just, I'd, I'd do rounds of it, like minutes. And, and I, I built up to where I was uh, sitting in that ice water for 30 minutes at a time because I thought that I could swim a kilometer in 30 minutes. And uh, so I, I ultimately went to test myself and went to Wyoming uh, right around frost time and uh, swam in this uh, lake. I'll send you some, some pictures you can post on here if you want, edit them in. And uh, I made it 860 meters so I was 140 short but uh, I was getting to the point where my arms weren't working the way I wanted them to and I wasn't able to like complete a full stroke and I went under once and uh, I told my wife that I wouldn't die doing it so ultimately I had to you know yeah. not die 
and uh, I'll, I'll give it another go to try and accomplish the goal. But that was really challenging, also. That was uh, that was definitely um, it was difficult to do that and and fight through and and do that swim. And uh, you know now I'm just working on. I've had this long, long goal of running 18 minute three mile, but man, all the miles I did in that Ironman training are harder than the 18 minute three mile. Like it's just so hard to just shave seconds off of a mile. And like maybe a lot of people watching this, like, oh, an 18 minute three mile, that's not that bad. I weigh 220 pounds, so it's not like I'm, you know, some little 130 pound five foot six guy sprinting around like. I'm moving a lot of weight, so yeah. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. It's hard, though. I would imagine. I, I, I'm listening to you talk, and I'm, I'm visualizing what that's even like, and I'm already getting cramps just like that. <laughs> Not for me. You you enjoy that, bro. Yeah. I'm a podcaster now, man. I, I'm on YouTube 24-7, so uh, yeah. I'm happy with that. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm uh, – as as – you know, I'm, I'm just happy you're doing well. I'm happy you, you look physically fit, man. You still look like you could take my head off, which is, uh, <laughs> you know, it's possible. I'd rather just, I'd rather just talk about it on here instead of actually doing it. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we've had enough of, uh, we've had enough of working it out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah your left leg had plenty of working it out. <laughs> Amazing, man. I think it's, I think it's very unique for me to be in this position and to, to, as well have my guys listen to me talk to my coach because you know there's that circle of life type scenario going on here and uh, I talk about you regularly at the gym when we're training about what my coach put me through and the unique position that we're in now where we can have it be uh, heard by my guys at the gym which is which is really cool I think. I That's awesome man and I'm, I'm so happy to to hear about the position that you're in and, and to hear about the things that you're doing. And man, it just, like I said, there's no better compliment you could give me than to, than to say that, you know, you took something from me and you're, you're trying to pass it on. And, and that's awesome, man. Like it, it, it's great. Like I'm so happy to hear it. That's basically it, man. Forever grateful. And I would challenge anybody if they have someone in their life, if you have someone in your life that you have, have have lost contact with or or just are grateful for a specific instance but haven't said thank you in a way that you have closure from i would encourage you to reach out um i, I i've never thanked you like i'm thanking you right now and i think that that's why i asked you to come on here i wanted to show my guys where this all came from and it's it's from you I can't thank you enough, man. Like I really appreciate it, and and it it really just it makes me so happy to hear that you are where you are and you're doing what you're doing, man. It, it's it's awesome. Excellent. Any final words, Jake? Before I get you out of here, bro. Um, I mean, just if if you're uh, if you're you're passing along an awesome message here, man. Like I've I've watched a bunch of your podcasts, and I think it's awesome. And um, you know, it's just. The, the fight game's hard, man. Like, it's just, it's it's hard to be patient. It's hard to build those skills. It's hard to build up those things. And, and just, it, it's a lot of perseverance. Like I said, it took me eight years of just every day grinding to to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish, and that was to fight and win in the UFC. And, and uh, you know, I, I look back on those memories and, and those time in the gym, and I wouldn't change anything about it. So, you know, I'm, I'm really happy that you're, you're passing along the message of just, you know, hard work and grinding gets results. And underhooks win fights, and uh, Fire you know, is there. With with, the, with those messages, it's it's just uh, you know a road to success. You know, like right. uh, keep grinding, keep sticking with it. Underhooks win fights, and I'll get you get your hand raised. There you go, man. Awesome, man. This is this is really special for me, man. I really appreciate it, uh, guys. If you have any appreciation for me, hit subscribe. Hit the like button, hit the dislike button. If you still don't like me, I don't care. Uh, comment, share with your friends, Spotify rate and review, Apple Podcasts rate and review. Send me a private message saying, hey, Dave, you're fantastic. Keep it going. I don't give a fuck. Jake, thank you very much for coming on, man. I really appreciate your time. It has been an absolute pleasure for me to just talk this out and, and tell you how much you mean you meant to me and you still mean to me today i really appreciate everything you've done for me man thank you dave like i said that can't thank you enough for having me on i really appreciate it thanks 
Awesome. Take care of yourself, bro. We'll be in touch again. All right. Sounds good. Thanks.